positive things. Here we go. I just got caught talking positively there, Brian. <laughs> Welcome to a Celtic state of mind. It is Wednesday. I'm not Kevin Graham because he has taken a well-deserved break. He will be back next week. Just going to change the background. There we go. Um, and I'm joined today by Brian Degnan. And I was just saying there before we came on here, loads of positive stuff to talk about, I feel, in relation to the comings and goings at Celtic Park, Brian. And... Um, We've got a couple of weeks to catch up with yourself as well, so loads for us to talk about. I think the big story is the one that's on the uh, the strap line, Chris Julian. Uh, James McKenzie, who is the newest recruit to the Axon team, we hope will be able to, to come into the conversation. His mic is playing up a wee bit. We had some technical issues yesterday and a few today, but that is life, Brian. We will overcome these challenges. Chris Julian, let's talk about Chris for a bit. Um, the last few weeks, uh, there was a suggestion, Brian, that he wanted to stay and fight. I was a wee bit dubious about that because there was no quote. And also, I think my take on it was, I think Angel decide, Chris, no you. Um, where were you with Chris Julian before the news broke last night that there is a deal in the works? And as if by magic, Brian has frozen as well. I'm going to have to go solo unless Brian can join us. I wasn't sure for a moment because um, it doesn't look like a freeze frame. And it doesn't also look like he's winding me up. So what we'll do until Brian and or James come into the conversation is we will certainly have a wee chat with everybody in the comment section. If Brian drops out, there he is, he's back. 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 You're back. back. What happened there. Do you know what, Paul? It's pre-season and if you're going to make mistakes, you make them in pre-season, right? Exactly. So we're a bit yeah, rusty, mate. We're a bit rusty. Here we go. So where are you with Chris Julian before the Instagram post and then the rumour about Schalke and uh, the the loan that could be a, a, a option to buy at the end of it? Um, it might end his time at Celtic Park with a bit of a whimper, unfortunately. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'd be, I, I had my crystal ball at a while back and um, when... Chris Julian played for the B team. Mm. I said that would be the last time he played in a Celtic jersey. Um, I just had, I, it seemed, you know, because I, I think he's a good player. I do. Um, I th it, what's interesting is whenever a player's about to leave, they're either the worst player ever or the best player ever if they've not played for a while. So it's either the case of Julian would have been fit, would have won this, would have won that, or mm. we don't need him, he's rotten. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I like Julian, I was a fan. I think that. Um, he is a goal threat, the likes of which we've not had for a while. And mm -hmm. I think that's something we, we need in whoever we sign to replace him. Um, and listen, Big Chris will always have Hamden. Um, you know, the, the, the header to win the, the cup final. So those are good memories. Um, seemed like a good guy, but it's just not worked from under Ange. And, and that's okay. That happens sometimes. Um, he's been a decent servant. What's interesting is the way this deal structured, or we believe it's structured by Schalke, because say it's a loan main option to buy. Hmm. So I was under the belief that he only had a year left, but apparently Celtic are going to automatically trigger the year extension so that they get a fee, which is actually very clever in good business. Um, these um, sort of loan to buy deals seem to be the kind of new thing. Also, We've done it. We looks like we might be doing it for other players. Um, it's a bit like Curry's, isn't it? Where you buy now and you pay in 12 months. <laughs> it's a bit of a strange, a bit of a strange old system, but it's becoming quite popular. So um, as long as we got a good replacement in, uh, wish him all the best. Um, and I think, he, I think he'll be good for uh, Schalke. Yeah. James, just a wee test. Are you good? Are you good to go? Yeah, it, sh it should be good. I was just having troubles. My earphones went connected to my laptop there. Yeah. Superb. It's just slight technical glitches. These things happen. Brian uh, and I have been talking about Chris Julian. We're going to dedicate the first part of the show to where we are with Chris Julian. And I think um, going right back to when we signed him, massive, massive sign in terms of the fee. You know, if we were to go out right now and buy a £7 million player, it would be, you know, it would send Twitter into meltdown, right? Centre half comes in, um, international underage honours for France. Um, I was disappointed that he wasn't thrown in to the, the Champions League qualifiers. Remember him and Ball and Golly sitting on the bench, £10 million worth of talent, whilst Callum McGregor's playing at left-back. But I think, in time, he became 
for me, an integral part of the side, a successful Celtic side. As Brian was saying, you've got the high points, uh, Lazio and uh, the League Cup final, which was one of the most nerve-wracking games I've ever attended uh, because I think that, um, you know, that goal, Fraser Foster's performance, Frimpong until he got sent off was outstanding, giving us an out ball, but Rangers were all over us and it gave us the first kind of indication or one of the first indications that this side was sussing out how Celtic played. Um, it might have happened a wee bit earlier than that, but that was a big indication. We played Lewis Morgan up front, we threw El Yunusi into the game and he wasn't ready. He, he looked as though he was playing with his moon boot on in that first half, El Yunusi. But what Julian came through for us, and I think my only criticism at that point, I didn't like his celebration when he scored. <laughs> that was it, when he used to pretend he was ripping his jersey off. And then there was these concerns, and I'm not sure if I bought completely into them. Exactly, Brian, that was it. Um, I wasn't sure if I totally bought into him being spooked by certain physical players. I know that he didn't have the greatest game against Lyndon Dykes at the Tony Macaroni on one occasion, the 2-0 game, I think it was. Um, but I thought he, he was a really good asset to the team. But I don't forget the fact that the Kilmarnock game, James, I remember him and I are getting dogs abuse um, because we drew one each. Uh, that was the ball and golly game, of course, and we were crying out for a centre half to come in, and we brought Shane Duffy in, and of course we know that the season just unravelled. Julian collided with a post, and he's never been able to come back in uh, to the side and into the reckoning. We said a few weeks ago, James, the decision would be Angie's, and it looks as though it has been Angie's. What's your thoughts about Julian going out? Is it time for him to go out and and make the deal permanent at the end of this this loan? Yeah, I've said a few times in the podcast before, I'm a big Christopher Julian fan. I thought some of the criticism he was getting was undeserved. They hadn't played a game for Celtic and all of a sudden they'd gone from being our best centre-back to he needs to be sold. I think Ange, I don't know if it's issues with him playing out from the back because it's never screamed out as... You never watched Julian and thought, this guy can't play out from the back. I don't know if it's attitude problems because I remember towards the end of last season... He said in the media he wanted to play that last game of the season. Um, for me, you don't go to the media to make your intentions known. You go to the manager and you make your intentions known. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't seem to be in Andy's plans. The only minutes he got was that Wraith Rovers game when he got the standing ovation in about half an hour. But it's sad to see him go, but he'll be remembered as a player for some of his big performances. He was a big game player. And it's the sort of games that you'll talk to people about in the future. Absolutely, he was a big game player and um, he, he really stepped up and I think there are players um, when you you look back even at previous managers who the manager, the gaffer just doesn't fancy them and I think back to the, the scenario that Brennan Rogers walked into um, and obviously there was all that talk around you know senior players perhaps uh, not doing the business for Ronnie Dyla or not being the examples you would expect, expect them to be um, and quite... Uh, Quickly, Brennan Rodgers started stripping them out of the side. The only one I think that survived was Bruni. But if you think back to it, though, Chris Commons stuck around for about a year, didn't he? And he just didn't play. He, he refused to play him. And I think that, you know, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but, you know, there was word coming out, Julien said he's going to stay and fight. Ange makes the decisions. Next thing you know, there's an Instagram post. He's on a plane. I think a wee bit before that in our WhatsApp group, I had forwarded a message, can't take credit for it, from another WhatsApp group saying Julian's on his way to Schalke. Then that picture pops up. No sure I like all that, to be honest with you. You know, if a club hasn't made an announcement and a player's been a bit naughty by putting out the Instagram post, I'm on a plane, I'll not be at training tomorrow kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, Romano, who's always late to the party. He was late to the party with the Juranovic story. He was uh, obviously behind the times when it comes to that one. And he comes out and says that he's away. But like yourself, Brian, I was interested in the contract situation because I think, you know, what I tend to do is I look at Transfer Mart and have a look at their, their contract expiry date. But it looks as though Celtic have had this, this uh, additional year that they've been able to um, spark into life. And I said a few weeks ago, I'm glad that we're starting to get our heads around how to use loans properly. That went down like a bit of a lead balloon in some quarters who said we've always used them well. I don't think we have. I really don't. I don't think we've used them to our advantage as well as we now are. And that's players going out and coming in. Uh, Carter Vickers being the obvious, the obvious example uh, for those coming in. But it then leads us to the next question. If, if Julian's going out, we need to bring someone in. We've lost Beaton, who 
should never have been a centre and a half, but you know he was um, an emergency centre and a half. We've we've lost Liam Scales, who could who could play there as well. And although we've made Carter Vickers permanent, at least there's that wee bit short at the back. And you know there has been a story, unsurprisingly, that we may turn our attention back to Ko Itakura following the collapse of his deal to Borussia Mönchengladbach. What's everybody's memories? Uh, Chris Julian, well, Magnet comes in, Magnet67, welcome back. Afternoon, Axrom team, and an afternoon to you. I feel for Big Chris, really impressed when he had a run in the team. Injury was cruel. I think, you know, at that time when he's having that, that run in the team, it wouldn't have actually surprised me if he was the next player that, that left Celtic. Because he was getting to that point, wasn't he? He was, he was really impressing. I trust Ange. He was obviously told he couldn't be guaranteed first team games. And off he plods. Lanky67, welcome back. CJ going to Schalke on loan. Jota to sign tomorrow, 6.4 million. Benfica will get 30%. Uh, Itakura and a solid CDM plus a striker were good to go. I'd love that to be the case. But again, we're kind of uh, torn in the WhatsApp group, aren't we, in relation to how much is this board willing to spend? Again, I asked the question, Brian, it's going to be a test of the board's metal. If you go to Itakura, you're talking £5 million plus, aren't you? Yeah, I, I don't know if he's going to come in. I think he seems to be one of these players who are going to be linked with forever. He's, uh, you know, maybe in five years we'll get him. It's a bit like Joe Hart. We've been linked with Joe Hart for, for a while and there's just always these players we seem to be linked with and I get the impression he had the chance to join before and he went to Germany. Then he's got the chance to join again and then he was in talks with Gladbach and apparently that's fell through. And I just don't know if Ange is going to be sitting there, sitting in his hands waiting for Itakura to, to come into the building. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he would be a good player. Obviously, he's linked with City Group. He played for the back, left pegger, which is what we need to send half for a bit of balance. But I, I'm not holding my hopes out for that particularly. Um, but we do need we do need at least one centre half. I said we needed that before Julian left. I think as much as I like Starfield, he needs a, a partner equally as strong as Carter Vickers, mm. and it has to be a defender that can be a goal threat as well. Although Carter Vickers has scored a few, he's not the tallest. Now I've got a cheek turn with people being taller, I'm a midget, but he's <laughs> no he's no a goal threat the way Julian would have been, and we need that in the box. So. And then that, that leaves you, say we've got this, say we've got a centre-half in to partner Carter Vickers, then we're left with staff out and Welsh's backup. We still need a, a fifth centre defender to be sort of backup to the backup, if you will, or to compete for that sort of second spot. Now, whether that's going to be uh, my main man, Dane Murray, or Boston Lowell, which would be mm-hmm. interesting to see if they step up. I think they've been training um, the, the past couple of days with the team. Or he signs another centre half. That remains to be seen. But irrespective, we desperately need a Champions League calibre centre half, in my opinion. I just don't see it being Itakura. Although, as I say this, it's probably going to break on Twitter that we have signed him. <laughs> but, you know, I just don't see it at this stage. To be fair, Brian, your your uh, predictions haven't been bad on Axon. There's been some howlers um, I don't from, gamble, your, from yours truly. What's that? I said I don't gamble, but I probably should. Yes, you you probably should. Um, if you were gambling, you probably would uh, get good odds on Starfelt being the first goal scorer because, like you quite rightly said, he never really has got that um, you know added to his game. Didn't score last season, James, and I think that Itakura. You know, obviously, we've all done our, our uh, research on the player. Um, yeah, I agree with Brian. I think it would be an upgrade, and that that's what I mean by is it a test of the metal of the board because you know. Axom's kind of split. Some people think we won't be spending any more than the kind of 18 to 20 million. I think if you push the boat out up to the 25 million pound mark and buy a player like Itakura, then you really are up in the bar. I mean, that, that I think instantly, and it seems a bit harsh actually saying this, but I think instantly that puts Starfelt as a second choice centre half. Um, you know, and when you look at his kind of journey last season, James, from um, understandably, you know, after getting thrown in at Tyne Castle, a bit ropey. To, to build in that partnership with Carter Vickers, it seems a bit unfair. Um, how do you think the board will view this? I mean, is this one of the reasons why we've been hearing these Juranovic rumours? I don't think we need to sell a player for £20 million to finance this. We've got the money. We've got the guaranteed Champions League riches. Let's really push this for, for Ange Postecoglou's tilt, um, not only domestically, but in Europe next season. What's your thoughts, James? Yeah, I think it's a 
Yeah, I don't think we really need to sell to buy. Celtic are in a pretty good financial situation. We came out from COVID pretty well. We didn't take as much losses as a few other teams in Scotland. And we've just had a good cash injection with the Champions League. I'm not too sure when we actually get that money. I'm not sure if that just accumulates over the course of the next season. But we don't need to sell any big players. I'm not sure if Itakura is much needed. It would, of course, be brilliant to sign him. But we forget we had a tremendous centre-back partnership last season. We had the best clean sheets in the league. We had the best defence in the league. Do you really want to break that partnership up? Is a centre-back much needed? Because Starfield came on leaps and bounds and Carter Vickers was rock solid at the back. I'm not too sure if... Uh, I think we just need depth at centre-back. We don't need a new starter. We need a bit of depth there. Mm. It's interesting that uh, Brian spoke about uh, Dane Murray. I think the other names that have been mentioned um, you know, in dispatches are Lawal, Boston Lawal. Toby Yemi and uh, Rocco Vata. These are guys that seem to be star performers for the B team. McManus, who's got that knowledge of how Ange works and how he wants to set up, is now working closely with the B team. So it's a good point, Brian, that one of these guys may well be earmarked to be the next Stephen Welsh, if you like, you know, on that progression, uh, stepping up to the, the first team. It'll be very interesting to see if any of them are able to do that. Um, really keen to hear your thoughts, everybody that's tuning in on YouTube. Thank you very much. Gary Oliver, the curious case of Chris Julian, indeed, on paper would be ideal for Angie's system. Clearly a breakdown in relationship. Looks like the big man chucked to toys the last six months. I remember Brian saying it after that B-team appearance. And there was a few comments saying that he didn't look interested. And uh, I think we, uh, tongue-in-cheek, mentioned the attitude shown by Marvin Comper when he was playing for the B-team, scoring a few goals at Capolo, etc. Uh, Jungle Lion, how did Julian pass a medical? Well, here's the big thing. It's, it's obviously that, um, you know, going through the rigours of, of a medical. It will be interesting to see because, uh, you know, it's it's been a, a case of him never being fit enough or is it something that's more psychological, getting through that barrier to get back in the team or indeed, did Ange just no fancy him and he's been fit all along? We will find out soon enough. Of course, you can fail a medical and still buy a player. You know, John Hartson famously failed a medical at Rangers uh, but he, he failed at a medical at Celtic as well and he tells that story and O'Neill still signed him. So you can still sign the player. It's just obviously um, with these conditions, that that's the risk. There's something wrong with the knee or the hip or wherever it might be. Um, Simon Fedeni. Welcome, Simon Fedeni. Um, I hope the weather's well in that part of the world. We do love uh, Neely Mokin from Denny as well. Who's the other player that comes for Denny, James? Young Owen Moffat. Is he a Denny boy? I think he is. Not that um, <laughs> I'm sure Owen Moffat's a Denny boy. Well, maybe Simon Fedeni can let us know. If Big Julian is going to talk to Schalke, then I don't think we're getting much money for him. As I said, they were priced out of buying Ko Itakura, who was there on loan. Of course, yeah, there's another link. Um, I've seen a figure of 1.5. Is that... Yeah, that's what I saw. 1.5 to 2 million. Yep. And it's a case, I think, James, of... You know, we've shelled at 7 million on this guy. And I think we've had our money's worth. Let's be honest, yeah, it didn't end the way we wanted it. To end, but it's about trying to recoup some of the cash on on the investment, um, and I don't think we could get any more than the one point five quoted. If we could get that, then then fantastic. It's maybe um, about getting the wages off the books. I think I think he's yeah. he, he would be one of the highest earners with the money that we paid for. Him, you'd imagine he'd be on heaps of cash. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he'll be right up in that kind of top bracket, won't he? Um, now talking of getting people off the wage bill. Again, interestingly enough, don't know how much of this has been lost in translation. Barkas has been speaking about his uh, time at Celtic. And I was having a look at the, certainly the translated version of that, that interview. We've been having a, a good chat about goalkeepers. Um, it didn't work out for Barkas, and I think the Celtic fans' attitude is, or certainly for what we've seen on Axon, we don't speak for all Celtic fans. I've got to say that in an asterisk. Um Barkas, we wish them all the best, move on, you hope he does well for the year, so we can recoup something, you know, of the £5 million. But he's come out, apparently, Brian, and said that, you know, he wouldn't recommend Celtic to a goalkeeper. But I think you've got to caveat that that by saying that he couldn't integrate into the first-team squad. He spoke about that because of the COVID thing, using different dressing rooms, staying in a hotel, not being able to do the usual, meeting up with teammates for lunch or, or whatever it is footballers do. Um, Nando's I think it is a lot of the time so Brian what, what was your thoughts 
about the comments. I mean, I, I hate when a player leaves and has a wee swipe at Celtic. I remember Burigter did it, didn't he? Dirk Burigter did it. Um, and now Barkas has done it. What was your thoughts on these comments? I mean, I think the, the people that usually take a swipe at the club are the ones that couldn't make it at the club. Um, so it shows, you know, a bit about their character. What's going to be interesting is if, uh, if old hologram hands goes to his new club and is as rotten for the aim as he was for Celtic, then his words are very hollow, in which case he'll look a fool. So he's made it on for his own back, if that's what he said. Um, I'm going to defend him slightly, though, which I know is unusual for me. But so we're biased because we love Celtic. Right, that's that's the one common thing of, of us guys here, everybody watching. We love Celtic, we love the club, we're biased. Right, because we can't think how dare someone say anything bad about the club. What it could have been talking about is just his experience, and you have to say his experience has been poor. COVID's been a factor, yeah, his ability's a factor, certainly. Um, he's maybe not only people, everybody's, everybody watching and everybody here at some point has had a job or they've went to a company and they've not enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. There might be people there that love it, they just don't fit for whatever reason. So I think. It, if he's not enjoyed it, fair enough. And if that's what he's saying, okay. I, I, it's not my view, obviously, because I love the club, but I get it. If he's not had a good time there, fair play, he's entitled to his opinion. If he's slating the club and saying that they were somehow responsible for his distinct lack of goalkeeping ability, then I've got issues with that. But, you know, as I say, it's always the ones that, that don't really find a lot of success. Very few people that have been successful or good players for Celtic talk ill about the club. Mm-hmm. Um, Derek Borichter is another cracker, my cinema pal. Um, he's another cracker that, that, again, never contributed and didn't set nice. So you can see a pattern forming there and it's certainly the common denominator is the lack of success at the club. I definitely. I think I, I, something just came into my mind there, like a flashback, Brian, when you mentioned Borichter at the cinema. Um, I think the only thing he did when he was at Celtic was some kind of photo shoot with his girlfriend or, or wife modelling belts. Look it up on Google. The pictures are out there. But when you look at a player like Brigter or, or indeed Barkas and um, you, you kind of think to yourself, right, has it worked out? Uh, not worked out, rather, because it's just bad luck? Or can you go on and prove that you were always a good player It just didn't fit? And I think when you look at players like another sh- former Schalke player, Timu Puki, right? So he leaves Celtic and he proves he's a bl- he's a bloody good player, right? Prolific goal scorer, um, just didn't work out. And you and you know, na- no bad blood, you know either way. We 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 put he never says anything bad about the club, and you just wish him all the best. And it's good to see him doing well. But then when the likes of Berigter or Barkas have a swipe, listen guys, just concentrate on your own game because Berigter achieved the square root of nothing when he left Celtic. Um, and I hope that Barkas does do well. James, because it might mean that we can recoup a million, a couple of million quid. I'm sure that will all be in the contract. But um, you would rather, James, that, that pl- people just moved on and, and, and didn't have that negative swipe at the club, don't you? Yeah, I completely disagree with what Barkas was saying in the media. He was talking about, he wouldn't recommend Celtic for goalkeepers, but over the last 10 years, Celtic have been known for mm-hmm. making and reviving careers of goalkeepers way. Gave Fraser Foster a successful loan spell at the club, which led to a permanent deal and then a path to the Premiership. Then we revived his career when he came back. Uh, Craig Gordon, after the layoff he had, he came in and revived his career. Just got to look at Joe Hart this season. The only outlier is Vercellus Barkas. So I don't really get what he's trying to say in the media there. No, I think that's a super point. You look at, I mean, Craig Gordon particularly, he was finished. You were getting used to see him as a, as a pundit. Um, on on uh, BBC Scotland, and then all of a sudden he's starting to get you know trial games. He had a trial game with, with or a training session with Rangers. He's got the Rangers training gear on, and we sign him, and it was kind of out the blue. But credit has got to be given, like James says, Brian, to Stevie Woods and the coaching team at Celtic because you know it does seem as though everything they've touched has turned to goal, except for one exception. I remember um, remember Foster comes in for his first loan deal. Celtic fans were not convinced with Big Foster. Couldn't kick a ball. And every half time, um, Woods was on the park pinging balls into to Forster. And I think there was a moment, was it the Hearts game at Celtic Park when Manyama scores a screamer, Hearts get a late penalty, Forster saves it. 
and almost turned his whole Celtic career around that night, still on loan. But as James says, we've got a great record recently, and Barkas is working with the same guys, Brian. So I, I think that was actually one of the anomalies uh, rather than the rules, because, I mean, the record we've had with goalies under Steve Woods has been superb. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Steve Woods, I think any keeper that's worked under him has spoke incredibly highly of him. Um, and the fact that, you know, and just in a slight rejig with his coaching staff, um, which I suppose we'll talk about later with Steve McManus going to the B team. Um, but the constant is is Stevie Woods. You know, he's, he's sort of, to, to paraphrase a great man, he's there and he's always there. Um, and he seems to be a, a constant. And there's a reason for that. And Ange isn't going to play favourite season when he's going to come in and say, oh, this guy's been here, we'll keep him. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's shown that he wants to rejig things and stuff. And he seems very, very happy with him. So, yeah, it, it's back to my earlier comments. It's um, the, the common denominator in people speaking ill of Celtic that used to play there are the ones that failed. And, you know, if you're no man enough to accept that you failed and you move on, and you need to take swipes, that shows more about your character than it does about your clubs. 100%, Brian. Now, Brown Warrior, welcome to the show. You're commenting on YouTube. And if you're commenting, then you probably already subscribed. So thank you for your support. Like the video. And uh, if you aren't subscribing, make sure that you click on that button and on the notifications. Um, we have some big content coming your way. As soon as this bulletin finishes, we're in a car to Glasgow to interview one of my favourite bands. And we're interviewing them in Glasgow. That will be on the channel very soon. If you think Starfelt is Champions League level, you might want to go to Specsavers. I think Starfelt, for me, um, I think I'll go back to what James was saying there. I think some of the criticism's been unfair. Early doors, I thought it was he, he looked rusty. He really did. But Ange's kind of spoken about that period and the fact that they had to throw him in. I don't even think he had a training session with his teammates. He was thrown in at, at Tynecastle, one of the hardest away grounds to make your kind of uh, baptism of fire, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it, it would be an interesting one if we were to buy some, someone who would maybe be perceived as an upgrade in Itakura. Um, it would certainly make us a lot stronger, as Tony Haggerty keeps saying. You can't have too many good footballers at the club. Strange love the doctor. Yeah, I remember you, you were saying about Julien, looking forward to seeing him playing in the pre-season games. Uh, wipe the slate clean. It seems like a good kind of time for Julien to wipe the slate clean. And there you go. Uh, you never know what Ange has in store for you, but he is definitely the man um, at the helm making all the calls. And that is a refreshing um, thought as well. Monte's back in on the chat. It's Bolly, Barkas and McCarthy we need to get off the wage bill. Now, the reason I brought that up, we've had a discussion over the last few weeks about uh, the potential for a player to come to the fore, a player who's already at the club, who is going to be the Tony Ralston of of this season. Um and I, I threw out that Eddie Gucci might be that player, James, simply because he hasn't really got started, not really through any fault of his own. Um, he's obviously a quality player. You look at the fact that, um, you know, he has had two bites at the cherry now with British football, having had a spell at Leeds. And I'm pretty sure that will motivate him, the fact that it didn't work out. Um, but I, I've also read with interest that Mick Carey, according to Peter Grant, might be that player um, who's going to have a revival and who's going to shine. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Because I've not seen anything so far that would suggest that James McCarthy's that player, but I've seen plenty that Eddie Gucci could be, a, a, you know, play a much bigger part this season. Yeah, I think Eddie Gucci's Celtic career starts this season. He got unlucky with the injury in the Alwa game. It, was, it should have been a red card, to be honest, that tackle. But when he's played, I think he's maybe had a combined 60 or 70 minutes. And I've always thought he looked quite, quite, quite a silky, cool sort of player, good die for a pass. So you'd hope that he will get chances, whether that's at the whole midfielder role or a bit further forward. And James McCarthy, I've never really been fully sold on him. It's not as if when he's played for Celtic, he's played bad. I remember he had, I'm not sure what team it was against, but he got a really good assist. So you'd think James McCarthy, just to sort of shut up shop, Compose the midfield, he'll come in for that sort of role. Uh, was that the game against Wraith Rovers? The same game that Julien yeah, got his wee cameo? A uh, defence splitting pass, it was excellent. Um, I think there was a moment, I might have mentioned this before, in the season that was almost make or break for McCarthy. He's playing against Dundee United, and I think he's having a very good first half. And your man Fuchs absolutely done him 
done him a, a proper dull one and he has to get taken off at half time. And I think that really just completely knocked his season off, off track because the players that come in at that stage perform brilliantly and then we strengthen that area of the park by bringing in the likes of Eddie Gucci and Matt O'Reilly, Rio Hatate. Interestingly enough, Hatate um, may have crossed paths with uh, Itakura in 2018. I'm not sure if he did, but it was at that time that um, he Itakura left Kawasaki Frontale for, for Man City. So they may have crossed paths as well, which would be pretty interesting. Alan Robertson thinks massive or a big preseason for James McCarthy, for sure. And Paul Morphus reckons that Mikey Johnson is going to be that surprise success story. I haven't given up yet. Quite a few people have, Paul. But, you know, I would love to see Mikey Johnson doing well. Always make the same kind of, um, you know, I, I look at him and I, I make the same comparison to Lewis Morgan. Being a guy who, you know, didn't seem to have that physicality. He moves country, he moves uh, to the other side of the world and he does brilliantly. Um, maybe Mikey Johnson needs that, I'm not too sure. But Brian, when, when you're looking at a player who might come to the fore, do you think McCarthy or Eddie Gucci is that player? Possibly. I think Eddie Gucci, um, he, I think he made some comments the other day that actually he's looking forward to, he's been adding, trying to add goals to his game. So I think he's probably going to be pushed forward. I don't see him being that sort of holding player for Celtic. I think um, I think he's, he's a bit too slight for that. Um but it, it, it maybe that's sort of Hitati type, but he's sort of covering and pressing off the ball. I think that might be more his strength. Um, McCarthy's an interesting one. I think McCarthy's a very good player in his position. I just don't think that position's suited for Celtic under Ange, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I think in most other teams, he's a, he's a solid player. He's, he's really good at breaking up um, opposition attacks. He's, he's really strong in that sort of defensive midfielder. But what he's not is the sort of ball, sort of retaining, sort of turning attack into defence. Number six that Ange seems to really like. So I, I think he's a good player in the wrong team. However, I do think that, you know, maybe in the Champions League, if we're under a bit of pressure the last 15 minutes or so, I think he may be quite tidy to bring on his shore up mm. because that's very much his game. Um, so you may still see a roll from, but I don't think he's going to be a breakout. Um, I think that we need to desperately sign a, a really strong, at least one really strong defensive midfielder as well. I've been I've been harping on about Big Vinny, Denise Souza. Um, yeah. You know, I'm still hanging on to hope that that's going to come come true. I drove. It, it's been a weird thing. I drove Man City have sort of bought the rest of these. You know, they own like 50%, so I'm not sure if they bought the rest of it to try and loan them. Because right. he said he's a man, he claims he's a man City player now, so I'm not really sure what the gig is, but I'm, I'm hopeful he's going to come in. Um, and like the, the, I can't remember who it was, but whoever was commenting about Starfield, irrespective of your opinion of him, we need to be signing players at Champions League quality. So the, uh, for me, there's no point saying Carter Vickers and Starfield are good enough, or McGregor's good enough, or Morelli's good enough. We need other players because if they get injured, we get left with. You need players that can come in and drive them and compete. It's like having two good players for every position. You, you desperately need it. So I don't think we should ever be signing players just for depth. We should be signing players that can compete with the players uh, above them. So it's like, like say for example, uh, um, the the left back willing to bring in. Mm. Like you can guarantee that Greg Taylor is probably on his level. But he will fight and scrap and train in any opportunity he gets to get that jersey back. He'll take it. That's particularly true at centre half. And just said himself, goalkeeper in the two centre halves are positions he does not rotate, which you've seen. He doesn't tend to change them at all. So if you get that jersey, you need to fight to keep it. Yeah. Yeah. But you need somebody, you need somebody behind you that's just as good or better, that's driving you to be better. And that competition for places can only drive us on further. And Ange does not strike me as a man through anything through action or word that's going to rest in his laurels and be happy with things as they are. He always want to improve. And I think as much as guys like uh, Kyogo are, are they seem as being excellent in top drawer, I think if Ange's opportunity to bring in a striker of equal or better quality, he'll do it and force the players to compete. And I think that's the right way we should be going all the time. I don't actually think we, should, we need to sign a striker. But the point is, you should always look for good players, as, as Big Tony says, 
get them in, get them to compete, and the best player is the one that plays. I, I think the best example of that, Brian, last season was your right back scenario with, with Ralston and Juranovic. We didn't really have that same competition at left back. If we bring in Burnaby, then we will. I don't think we had the same competition at centre half for the reasons we've already spoken about. Julien was a bit part player. Beton's not a centre half or shouldn't shouldn't have been uh, deemed a centre half. If we bring in Itakura, we then get that. We never had it in goalkeeper scenario either. And we've, we've probably got that now with Seagrass. So I think you're right. You, you know, you've sussed Angie's kind of intentions there. Michael McDonald, don't leave that there, Paul. Is it the view? It's not the view, but it's the same era as the view. It's not the view, I just said. It's club um, coming. No, uh, not yet. Uh, but you know what? We're op- we're open. We're open to these kind of things. We'll see. Um, S Club Seven, indeed. Deary, deary me. You're showing your age there, sir. Um, <laughs> one player you, you were talking about the the guys that were like perennially um, linked to. One player I always remember, and this is for the old heads who might have watched Celtic in the eighties and the nineties. There was a there was a striker called Ray Stephen, right? And he played with Dundee. He was a prolific striker. And he got a move to Nancy, right? And he was over there from 87 to 91. And the whole time he was over there in France, Celtic were linked to him. And every single time they were linked to him, the, every, whatever paper it was used the same picture of this guy with a dodgy moustache. And you actually look back on it and think, did the guy even exist? It was just like they used to just roll him out every time you needed a striker, right? And it was Ray Stephen with this moustache and a dodgy hair doing all that but the 80s and 90s um, old school fans will remember that for sure but you mentioned Burnaby and it's interesting because you know one comes in two go out James and we're talking about having that competition that we've had at right back and and you know having a similar kind of level of competition at left back if and when he comes in Burnaby um, I think he gives us that I don't think to be honest with you that he's an automatic first pick um, but on the way out goes Liam Scales and Montgomery. Montgomery taking his second loan deal, this time to St Johnston, whereas Scales goes to Montgomery's old club, Aberdeen. Scales is now 23, Monty's 19. Interestingly, the deal for Monty is only up to January, so it might be an injury crisis they've got up in Perth. Um, the first thing I would ask is, do you think there's a... I mean, it, when I look at Scales, do you think there's a way back for Scales? Do you think he has a Celtic future, James? I think... I always go back to Anthony Ralston. Nobody saw a future for him at Celtic, but then they proved everybody wrong. So you never want to write a player off. There's always going to be a chance for Liam Scales, but he has to show his quality on loan at Aberdeen. And Jim Goodwin seems pretty high on him, so he's going to get the opportunities there. You would think he would be a starter, because some of the centre-backs have left already. Declan Gallagher and Andy Constein have both went out the door. So that leaves a good pathway to the first team for Liam Scales. On Adam Montgomery... I would hope he's utilised more in an attacking sense because I don't think left-back is his position. He was utilised at left-back only really because Greg Taylor was injured and we had no one else to turn to apart from... Was Bobby Bongal even there at the time? And No, he went on more in January, yeah. Um, so Montgomery, he was only probably really, we were able to turn to mm. with the injury crisis. I'd like to see him used at left wing at St Johnson, but they play with wing-backs... So you wouldn't think he would be playing left wing, but you you think you'd get some chances there. Well, the, the thing for me is, with Scales, I remember he came in, and I think I commented about um, whether or not, or I doubted whether or not he could have the step up to the Scottish League. And some of our Irish friends in the comments um, pointed out that there isn't a massive step up and that he would do well. And I think I was really interested to see how well he did. And I think he did impress quite a bit, Brian. I mean, remember his goal at Tanadice, for example. And, you know, there was a cross, of course, um, up at Ross County that night where we won 2-1 at the death. He he was pivotal, I think, in the first goal up at Ross County. And um, he was kind of deployed on the left-hand side, even though he said he was better at uh, left-hand side central defence. Um, which I think was a position he could have been utilised in in various times of the season. Um, do you agree with James? Do you think that it's all about going away and getting the game time, building that up, and perhaps coming back to forge out a, a future at Celtic? Because I think Jimmy Goodwin's talking about um, his kind of aim is to keep him at the club permanently. Yeah, I, I, I've got to disagree with you, James. I don't see a, a future for him. And I get what you're saying with the Ralston comparison, 
and that people wrote Ralston off and then he came in. The difference being Ange came in, Ralston was written off and never knew who Ange was. When Ange came in, he made Ralston better. Scales has been there for a year under Ange. And we're talking about letting Julian go, we've let Montgomery go. So when we need a left centre back or a left back, and he can do both, and he's found out, that for me indicates he's probably not going to be an answer. And I say, if he's had a year's training under Ange, and he's loaning him out, is he going to be trained better at Aberdeen? I don't think so. Now, of course, I've been wrong before. I could be wrong again. If he goes to Aberdeen and he's absolutely ripping up and he's becoming the, the Van Dyke of of the North, then, you know, I certainly will take him back. But I, I get the impression that it's, it's probably probably not going to be um, a future Celtic player, if I'm honest. And it, it's more, I think he goes to really good ability. I actually like him. I actually wanted to see him at centre half. Mm-hmm. I think a few times in here I'd said, you know, when, when Starfield was having a bit of a wobble, I'd really like to see him given a the chance there. I just don't see it happening now, though. I think if you have the opportunity there for you to take, and you've been playing under Angie, he knows you well, and the opportunity comes up and you get loaned out, it probably doesn't spell it well. And um, the interesting one is Montgomery. Uh, I don't want to say I'm disappointed, but I would have hoped he would feature. Mm. I thought he looked quite bright under Angie at the start. I actually thought he put in some good performances. Well, there's work to be done, but unless it's, you know, I say I can emergency one thing and he's back in January, as you say, he might feature, but um, like like a lot, I, I made a bold claim that the guys that were on loan last season when they feature for Celtic again, and I stick by that, and I think guys like Yuri Gide, Shaw, things like that, they'll fall into that camp. I think you see them sort of disappear, probably on loan. The, the Curry's route, I'm going to call it, where you go on loan and you buy them next year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think big skills, you probably see some sort of deal. If Jim Goodwin's talking about making a deal permanent already, you've got to imagine they've had these discussions. So, so no. Sorry, James. Go to disagree, pal. <clears throat> the thing with skills, I guess, is um, it was a hefty fee for a club like Aberdeen. When I mean, Celtic bought him in at 500 grand, it's like a punt. I mean, and I don't mean that disrespectfully to anyone because half a million pounds is a lot of money. But for a club like Aberdeen, that's a huge signing. So if we are going to sell him, it'll be, I guess, it's something of a loss. Michael McDonald is uh, coming in with the guesses. Franz Ferdinand, I get called a name dropper anyway, but I'm going to do it because their drummer, Paul Thompson, actually, um, I met him last season outside the ground. Um, I don't know why I was at the ground because I don't go to the games, obviously, but I was outside the ground with a ticket for the drummer of Franz Ferdinand and... Um, it was bizarre going into the, into the stadium afterwards because he, he came up with another drummer, Paul Quinn, from the Soup Dragons and Teenage Fan Club. And they're all Celtic fans, and I think that tells its own story. Stevie Kenny is going to Primal Scream on Saturday, buzzing for it. And I wonder if Bobby Gillespie will wear that suit, the uh, Screamadelica suit, because it's an absolute belter. It looks like a complete one-off. Last time I saw, saw Primal Scream live was at the Barrowlands, and... Um, he was wearing a pink suit that night and they were absolutely outstanding. Loved every single minute of it. By the way, here's the thing as well. Julian, if he was to leave and we were able to recoup a million or 1.5 million, it's still a massive loss for centre-half. And it wasn't that long ago that Jozo Simunovic also left. And he left on a free transfer, you'll recall. And that was after we almost sold him to Torino for four and a half. So what I've done is I've had a wee look to see how much did Celtic actually pay for uh, Simunovic. And there's a report here. There's actually a report saying it was over six million quid, according to Transfer Matt. And you're looking at that thinking, that's like a lot of money on two centre-halves because of a couple of um, bad injuries. And I don't think Simunovic ever got over that because he's away back to his homeland and he's playing uh, for Gorica, uh, now he's only 27, Simunovic. We must have we must have bought him dead, dead early. It must have been about 20 or 21 when we bought him. 21, I think. Yeah, and he, and he looked he looked the real deal. Um, he'll always be remembered for that tackle on Kenny Miller, <laughs> of course. Um, next question, Jota, have we bought him yet? Has he signed yet? What's the story? What's the latest, Brian? What's holding up Jota signing permanently? Well, I think he's... I think him and Natasha are having a competition for who can hold the most holidays in a year. We managed in a world tour now, isn't he? He's, he's all over the place. I think he's in a might be hanging about with Kev Graham, actually. He's in holiday now as well. So uh, He never told anybody though, Brian, last week. No, no, he's, 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 a, he's a sneaky weasel. 
Um, no, but in seriousness, I think uh, it, all signs are pointing to Jota signing, right? Every report said he's signing today, he's signing tomorrow, he's signing next week. It's a done deal, it's a four year deal, fees agreed, whatever. I expect him to sign. Um, I think it's maybe just been a case of he's maybe had a wee extended break, now back for pre season. It's slightly concerning he never reported back in for pre season, but. Maybe maybe it's just an extra couple of days off. I think he was at the Benfica training camp, wasn't he? Um part of the looks of saying goodbye to a few people. So, yeah, we um, the cash yeah. So what I hope is tomorrow they do the new home kit launch and Reese Water comes out wearing it. And um and that's the, the announcement. They were excellent. I've got to say I slaughtered the media team at Celtic last season for the lack of engagement. But I've got to say the um the Carter Vickers review was brilliant when I had the C the C V. He was updating it. I thought that was excellent. So hopefully, if they get a wee bit of maybe a wee George Michael track in the background, and uh, daughter swans it with a leather jacket, unzips it, new home kit, four year deal. That would be that. That would top it. That would be my take. But have it. are we are we expecting the home top tomorrow? Is that a thing? Is that happening tomorrow? No, or? I just I, I just like it to be. Yeah. It would it would be a good review, that's for sure. Um, Jota, yes, we have seen him wearing the jersey that you're currently wearing at the moment, James, which I think is going to go down as uh, quite an iconic jersey in the future. We didn't wear it that often, um, but Jota certainly looked good in it. He'd look good in a poly bag, let's be honest. Um, but again, th- this goes back to the conversation we had in the greater scheme of things. If we sign Jota and it's six and a half million quid, there or thereabout, Burnaby pushes us up to 18 point or 18 and a half, somewhere around that kind of ballpark. Then we're getting to that bit, aren't we? Where it's quite a big investment for one transfer window. Uh, we might be looking at loans, etc. But I, I, how confident are you? I mean, I was far more confident in Jota than CCV, yet it's still not a done deal, James. Or do you think, just think it's a matter of time? Yeah, I was relatively the same opinion as you. I thought Jota was going to be done before Cameron Carter, because I thought CCV would have taken a bit more convincing. But I'm always wary when there's lots of reports and things to seem to be dragging. Ever since the disappointment of the Eddie Howe deal breaking down, we know how long that saga lasted. Yeah, you're always going to be wary. It's the same reports every single day. It's just getting a bit frustrating. And there was a report this morning from Port- out of Portugal that he's apparently signed the contract today, but we've heard that story since about two months ago. So you're always going to be a bit nervous. I certainly will, and I think that there has been, um, you know, since the Eddie Howe debacle, that, that there's been that kind of worry in the back of your mind that uh, certainly nothing is done until the ink is dry on the contract. Um, a couple of uh, now ex helps I've got to say, Tom Rogic, it was expected that he would be going to uh, play his football in Indonesia with Persija Jakarta. It's fallen through, Brian. Um, what does the future hold for Tommy Rogic? I mean, I felt that that was almost a kind of semi-retirement move. Surely he can do the business at a higher level than that. Where do you think he'll end up? I'm not 100% sure. Um, the interesting thing with Roger was, I think he, he decided sort of personal reasons for pulling out the international tournament and stuff. So I don't know what his personal circumstances are. That might dictate where he goes. You know, he might be going to um, that team for, for a, a large payday for a couple of seasons and then come back mm. to Australia. Um uh, you really don't know. It's, it's hard to say. Um, I just want to call it something that I saw in the comments. Um, I think it was Monty was talking about Charlie and the boys at the Barrowlands. Well, Charlie and the boys are coming to Swindon on the 9th of July. Um, I can't wait. I'm buzzing for it just while we're talking about bands. I know people got upset when we talk about bands, but Charlie and the boys are fine. Um, so if anybody wants to take a trip to Swindon, buy me a pint um, at the concert, then come. If you just want to go see Charlie and the boys, that's good as well. But um, 9th of July... Looking forward to it. Um, but back to Roderick. It'd be interesting to see. I wonder if you go and meet Lennon. Lennon seems to be doing a Celtic reunion on Cyprus, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, Adam Matthews. And, uh, Andy Matthews. Uh, Adam Matthews is linked. And uh, maybe maybe uh, Tommy Roderick. Who knows? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd seen the, the links with Sorrell going over to um, Cyprus with, with, Lee, with Lee Griffiths with Neil Lennon and it, it prompted me to say never burn your bridges just the other day there because obviously Lee Griffiths is now a free agent and um, getting a bit worried that he might not get a club and then one of your ex-gaffers pops up somewhere else and it might work somewhere else for him uh, but obviously they their relationship seemed to have been a bit kind of like um, sour 
uh, through the interviews that they were both doing last pre-season. So w- when I consider it, and, and, I, and I look at um, the fact that, you know, Tommy Rogic, for me, he could have still done a job for Celtic this season, to be honest with you, James. Um, he's not particularly old, you know, when you look at the fact that, you know, he's played he's played most of his football at half pace anyway. I'm sure he's got a few years left in the tank. Where do you see the future for, for Tommy? Um, I think he'll probably go a bit closer to home. I'm not as well versed in the Asian football market as Ange Postacoglu, but you'd assume he'd be going to the going to Asia somewhere closer to home. I think so. And uh, remember the the deal that broke down as well um, when a couple of years back, you, you know, he was going to Qatar, and I don't think many Celtic fans would have been too disappointed. It would have thanked him for the memories, and then he comes back for one of his finest seasons, arguably his finest season last year. Um, so you do hope that uh, we see some more silky skills from Tommy, and we wish him well. Other excels on the move. Paddy Roberts has signed for Sunderland two-year deal. Uh, and Aidan McGeady is back in Scotland playing for Hibs. Decent moves for both players, do you think, Brian? Uh, yeah, yeah, it'd be good to see. Uh, hopefully, McGeady will score against the Rangers. And um, cause him out, then that'd be nice. Then Ivan Sproul and score a hat trick. That'd be good to see. But I'm glad for him. Um, it's going to be interesting. The, the fans now get to, to boo me and give him dogs abuse again. He can be the panel, panel villain for football. I just maybe this time the media will call it out for what it is. That would be interesting. Um, the BBC Sport interview recently, and the, the, I think it was um, the interviewer refused to call it why he thought it was. So, Lomi Gideon mm-hmm. was pretty clear. So, maybe he'll shine a light on it this time. But, fair play to him. Uh, good move from him. Lovely guy as well, Aiden, um, by all accounts. So, so no, good for him. I'm glad. 86 as well, still playing as a winger. And I think he'd do a really good job for him. So, good signing. I think it, I do think it's a good signing. The, the rumours had been kind of flying about for a while. Uh, McGeady and Hibbs James and he will be back playing in the Premiership this season but I think when I go back to you know McGeady breaking through what an exciting talent he was he was another one of these generational talents and so far as you know he'd been bubbling away under the uh, the surface for ages um, and I actually spoke through uh, doing research for one of my books I spoke to the, the Janny the school Janny that discovered him and he spoke about this young kid who I think at the time was eight, you know, playing with boys a lot older than him and uh, running riot. And, you know, it was just a case of he then gave Celtic the tip off and um, the rest, as they say, is history. I felt he left Celtic too soon, James, but he was obviously young and full of this ambition and he wanted to go away. And I think he's went away and he's now a very wealthy man. 36-year-old, still fit. And uh, I think Brian's right, though, James. You know, he went through... A period of time where he was he was basically abused and booed every single away away ground and at Celtic Park by the away opposition fans, uh, week in week out, because he was um, playing for the Republic of Ireland because he was a, a Catholic playing for the the Republic of Ireland. I mean, there's no other way to disguise that, and he basically laid that on a plate in that interview that Brian referred to. Um, do you think this will continue? even though he's been out the country for all these years? Do you think it's going to happen this season when he's playing with Hibs, James? Well, in the time away from Scottish football, he's only played more and more games for the Republic of Ireland. So I think there's still going to be a bit of hatred there from some Scottish football fans, not from Celtic. We'll still take him with open arms and welcome him to the club. But you'd think there's going to be still a lot of hatred from Scottish football clubs. Yeah, I do. You know what? I've I've listened to all his interviews, and um, you know, people used to say that he might have had a bit of arrogance about him. But I think that was also part of his game. I know that they were referring to the arrogance, maybe away from the ground, and and uh, there's obviously the the punch ups with Arthur Boric. He didn't seem to get on that well with Gordon Strachan, uh, by all accounts. I think him and Charlie Mulgrew turned up late uh, for a bust in pre season, and uh, that was the end of Mulgrew's Celtic career. He was punted and, and uh, McGeady and Strachan seemed to be at loggerheads um, whilst they were both at the club. So, yeah, we wish them well unless they're playing against Celtic. Um, I'm going to finish off because I don't know if this is fantasy football or not, but Jordan Larson, uh, his name has been linked to Celtic over the last couple of days. I've not had the opportunity to speak about it. There was a chat yesterday with Declan, Natasha and Paddy. Uh, I think they were looking at the fact that um, you've got the Kenny... 
Cheney thought that this is just nostalgia for the, the romantics amongst us, Brian, yourself and Kevin Graham, I think are the romantics in the Axon team. Um, or indeed, is it a fact that, you know what, we might, could we could be doing with a backup striker? Is Jordan Larson that guy? Are we, all, are we, are we just getting kind of like starry-eyed, Brian, with the nostalgia of bringing Larson back? Or do you think it would be a good move? I think he's a good player. I think he's, he's done pretty well. I think it's one of those ones where if he comes and what if he comes and he is it, it doesn't fit or it doesn't play well or it's bad. It's I don't know if I'd like to see it. Um, the, the reality is, isn't it? This is going to seem like a cop out, but Ange isn't going to sign him based on sentiment or for the the attention. He's going to sign him if he thinks he's good enough. So if he does sign, it's because Ange is giving the stamp of approval. And uh, I, I agree with the big fella. What I would ask is, is, is he better than Kyogo or Yakimakis? I'm not sure. Um, but as I said at the start, you can't have enough good players. So if he's available and Ange fancies him, then get him in. But I don't want him in just because he's second name's Larson, because I don't think that's going to help him. I don't think it's, it's a great idea. But if he's good enough and Ange thinks he's good enough, then of course you sign him. We go back to a point I made the other day when the subject, James, of um, open goal uh, and, and Paul Slane signing for the open goal team. Uh, and I basically said, you know, whenever you're, you're making a, a signing, it's got to be for football reasons. And I've used the example of Dunfermline giving a trout to Maradona's son back in the day because they thought there might have been a marketing opportunity for 10 Maradona on the back of Pars kits. Um, alas, he didn't sign. I think he ended up in the seventh tier of Italian football or something. But if if you're signing a player, it's got to be for football reasons. You can't sign them for content reasons. You can't sign them because the dad was a legend at the club. Or do you think you know actually it could be a quite a good signing for Celtic? I mean, uh, there was a time where he was he was spoken about in the kind of higher levels of seven to ten million pound as a transfer fee. What what's your thoughts, James? No, I think. He's clearly a good player. I remember he was linked with Borussia Dortmund. When Haaland was first getting linked away, Jordan Larson was getting linked with a £17 million move. And he's not been released by Spartak Moscow because he was a bad player. He's been released because of the current conflict over there. So the short sales would pay for the move alone for Jordan Larson. And it's not just... You wouldn't just be signing him because he was Henrik's son. You'd be signing him because he's a good player as well as Henrik's son. Yeah, you would. I'm just now trying to think about the trivia um, attached to players and sons who both played for Celtic. The only one off the top of my head, and I'm sure there's a few, is uh, Gordon Marshall, senior and junior. Both goalkeepers, both played with Celtic. Who else? Anton Rogers. Brendan was the manager. Oh, then... you've j- that's a flashback, <laughs> mate. That is a flashback. Mark Butchell's uh, daughter plays for Celtic. So there's a, a father and daughter combo. Any others out there, let us know. But to bring up Anton Rogers, God yeah. almighty. Um, on, on today of all days, where we're being very positive. Michael McDonald, okay, I'll put you out your misery. We are away to interview Rab and James from Las Vegas. And uh, that interview will be on the channel very, very soon. Las Vegas, of course, are headlining a gig that we're putting on in August at Leith. Um, and we're actually doing it as a charity gig for the Ronald McDonald uh, Charity House here in Edinburgh. And Glass Vegas are headlining. We've got 10 other bands plus a DJ. It's going to be a cracking day. It's an all-day event, but it is a Thursday, so I understand that people will be finishing their work at 4 or 5 and, and coming to um, Old Dr Bell's Bath, which is a beautiful venue. Uh, so we're going to go and speak to Rab and James. James, of course, did don the hoops once in one of the charity games, I remember. Uh, fulfilling his dream, former footballer himself, with clubs like Gretna, Falkirk, Stirling Albion, Dumbarton, Cowdenbeath, East Fife. Yeah, he played for all those clubs. Um, the now deceased uh, Gretna. So there you go, Las Vegas. Get subscribing if you haven't done so already. The pre season seems to be getting filled up, Brian, and um, we've, we're now we have SC Wiener Victoria the Austrian side, they're in the calendar alongside Rapid Vienna, Bannock, Ostrava, Blackburn, Legia Warsaw and Norwich City. Um, quite a workout for Angie's boys in the, the pre-season. But I asked the question, I'm going to ask it again, when are we going to get a, 
when are we going to get a friendly? When are we going to get a pre-season game with St. Pauli arranged at Celtic Park? It's never happened. We went over to Germany to play the centenary game over there. We've played them over there twice, I think, early 90s. In fact, we might have played them three times now because we played them in John Collins' time as well, a wee bit later, mid-90s, and then the, the centenary game. They've never came to Celtic Park. That would be a sellout in the pre-season, Brian. Why don't we do it? Yeah, it's a strange one, isn't it? It seems like one of those very obvious footballing things that, you know, it, it seems like something you should be doing every season. Doesn't it? Remember years ago, I think, we used to, we used to always play Man United. Aye. Every pre-season went through a phase, and you, you think that St. Paul would just be a, a, a fixture. It should just be something that we always do. So it's very unusual why it's never happened. Um, but you never know. It may happen soon, but yeah, very, very strange one. Um I don't know if it's a branding thing with the clubs, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure actually why, why, but you hope it might. Well, oh, so how on earth did I forget Simon Lynch? I wrote his dad's autobiography. Yeah, Simon and Andy both played for Celtic. Eamon, thanks for reminding me. I'm getting a bit old and dittery. Um, James, what's your thoughts when we look at the, the friendly fixers and sometimes you think, OK, I get that we need to play a couple of kind of warm-up games against opposition that aren't great. I remember us beating a team 21-0. I think it was under Vim Janssen. Uh, 21-0, we, we beat a team. But um, surely the St. Pauli thing, we need to keep that link alive. The club doesn't seem that interested. It's, it's more of a fans thing, isn't it? Yeah, it seems like more of a fans thing. But you'd hope we'd get more involved with the German club. If, as far as friendlies go, just for the sake of a good wee day out for the fans, you'd want a... Uh, Away friendly down in England. We remember how much fun the Sunderland away game was. We absolutely hammered them. Bright sunny day. The fans absolutely loved it. So you'd hope for one of those sort of away days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bring back um, a fixture with St. Pauli every day of the week. It would be a 60,000 sellout. Pretty sure it would be a decent atmosphere as well. And there might be a few parties in Glasgow around about that fixture. Listen, I've really enjoyed that uh, this afternoon. Kevin Graham will be back next Wednesday. I'm going to jump in the car and go to Glasgow um, to speak to our pals, Glas Vegas. There's my name dropping again, Brian. Shocking. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Thank you to Brian Degnan and James McKenzie for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind.